The 2020 election is anything but banal when compared to other United States presidential elections. After having perused the candidates, over 90 million people have already voted, which is about over half the final vote count from 2016. In this election, both campaigns are sedulous about voter turnout, specifically their voters, since there is an uncommonly low amount of undecideds due to increased partisanship, it is about which side turns out more people. However, the poll this year are reflecting the 2016 election. On Bill Clear Politics, Trump was polling 43% in 2016, and this election, he is also polling at 43%. One thing for sure, though, is that we should all hope for clear election results and not a fiasco like what occurred in the 2000 presidential election. I'd like to return to the classics. <laughs> Hello and welcome to an Election Eve special and what my predictions are for this election. First, in order to understand what might happen, I will give an overview on how American presidential elections take place. Established in Article 2, Section 1 of the U.S. Constitution, the Electoral College is the formal body which elects the President of the United States and the amount of electors each state receives is equal to its amount of representatives plus two because there are two senators per state. When the Constitution was being written, there were two drafts for how the legislative branch of government would work. The plan from New Jersey proposed equal representation for all the states, whereas the plan from Virginia, which still had West Virginia in it at the time, proposed a bicameral legislature with both houses of Congress being apportioned based on the population of a state. The Great Compromise implemented both ideas, a bicameral legislature with the House of Representatives being apportioned on population and the Senate equally representing each state. Every 10 years, the United States Census takes count of the populations of each state and therefore determines how many House congressional seats are in a state. In addition to this, the Apportionment Act of 1929 states that the House of Representatives would be fixed at 435 members. If you add 435 representatives, 100 senators, and the number 3 because Washington DC, which is not a state, gets to vote for president with the minimum amount of electors, you get the total number of electors, which is 538. And in order to win the presidency, a candidate must receive a majority, or in other words, 270 electoral votes. Initially, state legislatures elected those who would be voting in the Electoral College. However, this changed after the election of 1824. Andrew Jackson won a plurality of the electors and popular vote, but not a majority. Therefore, per the Constitution, the United States House of Representatives would determine the president, with each state getting one vote from their state delegation of House members for one of the top three candidates. Henry Clay, the candidate who came in fourth place and was also in charge of the House of Representatives as Speaker of the House, decided to put his support behind John Quincy Adams, who would then win the presidency via the House. And also, Clay would be put in Adams' cabinet as Secretary of State, a prominent position of power, which Andrew Jackson believed was clearly reason to believe that Adams and Clay had made a quote-unquote corrupt bargain. Over the course of the next four years, Andrew Jackson would begin campaigning for president again, and he would be also begin convincing states to swap electoral picking from the state legislature and instead having electors chosen by the people. Which leads us to today, where you aren't actually voting for a presidential candidate, but a group of electors who will then vote for that candidate. With that explanation out of the way, let me now get into my predictions. I've created a formula that can calculate an estimate of the amount of electors a candidate will receive. The formula works back beginning in 1996, going up to 2016 since the 2020 election hasn't occurred yet. One important thing to note is that after the 1992 election, American politics became more and more polarized, which is primarily why I think the formula has been able to hold up. It takes the past two elections, which would be the general and the midterms, and assigns them a weighted value, and is able to find an average, which is then used as the prediction. So here we have the 1996 prediction. It predicted that Bill Clinton would get 362 electors and that 
Bob Dole would get 168 electors, and in the actual, Bill Clinton got 379 and Bob Dole got 159. Then, using the 1996 general and then the 1998 midterms, I can then get a 2000 prediction. The 2000 prediction projected that George W. Bush would win with 274 electors and Al Gore would receive 261 electors. Now, keep in mind, this is an estimate. As you can see, if you add up those numbers, it does not equal 538. So then in the 2000 actual election, Bush received 271 electors and Gore received 267. Then using the 2000 general election and the 2002 midterms, I calculated the 2004 prediction. The 2004 prediction projected that George Bush would win against John Kerry with 288 electors to 250. In the actual results, he won 286 to 251. Then this process continues. 2004 and 2006 elections get 2008, Obama 317 to McCain's 220, the actual 365 to 173. Then you use the 2008 and the 2010 to get the 2012 prediction. With the 2012 prediction, it projects that Obama wins with 342 to Romney 196, the actual 332 to 206. Then using the 2012 and the 2014, the formula can predict the 2016 election. In 2016, Donald Trump would beat Hillary Clinton 306 to 232 electors, which was the actual results in 2016. Now keep in mind, I made this formula after the results of these elections, so this election Election, I'm seeing if the formula will hold up to its previous accuracy. Using the 2016 general election and the 2018 midterm election, the formula projects President Trump will beat Joe Biden 285 electors to 253 electors. We'll have yet to see what the actual results be. Now, what would a Trump win of about 285 electors look like? Well, let's go visit the polls. All right, according to the 538 elections, we have, have Nebraska 3 going to Trump, Wyoming going to Trump, West Virginia going to Trump, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Idaho, North Dakota, Alabama, Louisiana, Kentucky, Nebraska overall, South Dakota, Tennessee, Mississippi, Utah, Nebraska first, Kansas, Indiana, Missouri, Alaska, South Carolina, Montana, Iowa, Texas, Ohio, going to between Washington, Oregon, California, Nevada, Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, Hawaii, Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, Virginia, Illinois, Nebraska, Second, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Maryland, Delaware, New Jersey, New York, Vermont, New Hampshire, Maine's districts, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, and the District of Columbia. Which would put Joe Biden at 351 and Trump at 187. Now, if we slowly start to flip states until Trump reaches about 280 electors, first you flip Georgia, gets him past 203. Then North Carolina, Maine's second, Florida, Arizona, Nebraska second, Pennsylvania. And this would get President Trump to about the 280 electoral votes that the projection hit. However, it could be possible that Trump could flip Nevada. However, I think this would not be the likely scenario in this case, and that most likely it would just be up to Pennsylvania according to the 538 polling. Now, let's take a look at what the real clear politics will look like. Utah, Idaho, Montana, Wyoming, North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska, and two districts, Kansas, Oklahoma, Alaska, Missouri, Arkansas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Tennessee, Kentucky, Indiana, West Virginia, and South Carolina. And as Joe Biden winning, Washington, Oregon, California, Colorado, New Mexico, Virginia, Maryland, Delaware, New Jersey, Connecticut, Rhode Island, New York, Massachusetts, Vermont, New Hampshire, Maine, and one of its districts, and the District of Columbia, and Illinois. Hawaii. So now we will flip toss-ups until Trump reaches about 280 electoral votes. So Nebraska second, Maine second. Then you would get Texas, Nevada apparently, Arizona, Iowa, Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Georgia, and Florida. I don't find this too realistic with what I am seeing. I don't think that Trump will lose North Carolina, and yet win Michigan and Nevada. I think that's just a real unlikely scenario, which is, I think, the 538 is a better basis for making a projection map. 
Be sure to leave a like if you wish for more. I do hope you enjoyed my election coverage and prediction, and have a good election night.